Hello, everybody. I'm Storm Ushery, Conservation Education Manager with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And on today's recording or presentation, we've got Nick Foreman. He is our Carnivore and Small Mammal Program Manager, and he's going to be talking to us about wildlife monitoring for elusive species. So with that, I will let uh, Nick take off with it. Great. Thanks, Storm. Yeah, as Storm mentioned, my name is Nick Foreman. Uh, I'm the Carnivore Small Mammal Program Manager. Uh, so a bit about myself in the program. Um, I've got a master's in fisheries and wildlife science from Penn State University. Uh, did my work there on, on river otters and some population estimation. Uh, and then I moved on from there to work for the Pennsylvania Game Commission, working on black bears and fur bears, and then worked for Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources uh, again, working on carnivores, uh, fur bearers, before finally landing the position here as the, uh, the program manager for the carnivore and small mammal program. Um, essentially, in my program, I oversee the bear and cougar program. I'm the direct biologist for the fur bearer program. And then I also oversee our non-game mammal program. So basically anything that's uh, furry and has sharp teeth falls within my program. And uh, we do everything from the research to coming up with our management goals and objectives and, and strategies, um, and then working with the public on doing some education things. Um, and, and basically just for those species, everything that they need, we take care of in my program. And one of the big things that we do is, is um, research and, and monitoring for these species. And so that's what I'll get into with this presentation uh, is some of the, the monitoring techniques that we use. Um, for these really hard to monitor, hard to find animals, being those carnivores and fur bearers. So here at the Department of Game and Fish, we are responsible for the conservation of all wildlife species. And that means we need to know what is going on with our wildlife populations, how they're faring, what changes they might be going through. And with the diversity of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, we have a pretty extensive toolbox of techniques to monitor those populations. For a given species, there are usually multiple ways to monitor and observe them. Um, and biologists choose which technique to use based on a variety of factors, including uh, what information they're trying to learn about the animals, what question they're trying to answer, what environment they'll be sampling in, um, the timeline of when they need that information or data, and also the available resources, the number of people, uh, what they're gonna need to carry out that monitoring. But then probably most important is the animal's behavior and how effective the technique will be for observing it or getting the data that you need. There are pros and cons to each technique and no technique will capture all the information you need perfectly, um, but it's nice to have a, a range of options to choose from. In New Mexico, our large carnivore and fur bear species are almost all cryptic elusive species. They make a living out of, uh, by remaining out of sight. They don't occur in large groups like deer or elk or waterfall. They're typically crepuscular, which means they're most active at dawn and dusk. And so consider what all those behaviors mean when biologists are trying to come up with a reliable way to monitor these species. All those behaviors and characteristics impact a biologist's decision on how to monitor these species. But there's also the factor of what information are we trying to get? For wildlife managers, one of the most important pieces of information is population size. For a species that's hunted, trapped, harvested in any way, having, having an idea or exact number of population size will let you know whether the population can handle some losses from hunting or trapping and whether regulations or limits need to be put in place to prevent taking too many animals or to uh, allow harvest to happen in a certain way to make sure we're harvesting the right number. For some species, there are straightforward methods for getting population size, like flying in a plane or a helicopter to count the number of individuals in a herd. But for large carnivores and fur bearers with their elusive nature, we have to use a combination of, of field techniques and then statistical models to come up with an estimate of population size. In the past, uh, most studies and monitoring efforts for large carnivores and fur bearers depended on trapping and collaring the animal or taking information from harvested animals. These studies have drawbacks and limitations though. Trapping and collaring animals is a labor intense process. 
And especially for animals like cougars, the effort needed to trap or capture just one individual means that you're usually going to only able, you're going to only get uh, data from a small number of individuals out of the total population. You're limited in kind of how many animals you can capture in uh, a time frame that makes sense for getting the information you need. Additionally, the data you get from radio collars tells you where cougars are, and that's great if you're trying to understand the habitat use, movement, or where they are in relation to other species, but it doesn't give you an idea of how many cougars are out there, what the population size is. To, to estimate population size, you would need to be capturing individuals multiple times to use in a statistical model like a capture recapture model that estimates population size based on how many animals were caught and how many times they were recaught. That inability to estimate population size uh, using just GPS collars and tracking them, it's a similar drawback for, for other traditional methods. For a technique like putting out track plates where you set up a station with bait or scent lure to bring animals onto a surface like a, a ink pad or um, soft sand um, to register their tracks, you can get a sense of what species left those tracks and what habitat they show up in versus what habitat they don't if you're setting stations in different types of habitat, but you don't get specific information on individuals. You don't get the number of individuals that visited and you can't extrapolate those population statistics um, to keep track of population size and changes um, in the actual kind of population demographics. Data from harvested animals is useful for keeping our finger on the pulse of the population, but consider that this data is always a year old and based on individuals that aren't in the population anymore. And drawing conclusions on what is currently going on is limited, although we do get some information about kind of the age structure of the population and then also on kind of the, the distribution of, of males and females as well. While we still use traditional techniques, uh, since the 2000s, there have been some major advances in both sampling techniques and statistics to model and estimate wildlife populations. And advances in both of those areas made monitoring large carnivores and fur bearers much more efficient, effective, and produced more accurate results. A major area where sampling has improved and one that we use pretty often at Game and Fish is non-invasive sampling. So essentially non-invasive sampling means we can collect data from an animal without being there and without directly handling the animal. And that allows the, the animal to continue on undisturbed by the activity. One way to get data without disturbing the animal is by collecting DNA from its scat or hair, which is known as non-invasive genetic sampling. Another application of non-invasive sampling that we do is using trail cameras as a form of capture to get different population data. These methods can generate a lot of different data and they do so without the need of having a biologist present. Uh, you don't have to be right there handling the animal to get that data. You can be off doing other things. Uh, this also means that multiple sampling stations or sites can be deployed across a large area. And because you don't have an animal in a trap or a biologist isn't waiting there for the animal to come by, then they can be sampled uh, or visited over longer periods of times, weeks or months. And that means less labor because you're not out there every day trying to get these observations. So the DNA on scat and hair can be analyzed to gather a lot of information. Our main application of this method is to analyze the DNA so we know which individual left the, the specific sample. So it's essentially like, uh, like a CSI investigation that we're getting the DNA from an individual and identifying them. The genetic samples then are the capture uh, of that individual. Uh, and we use that in the statistical models to estimate population size, or we can use it for, for other information and other purposes. Uh, the DNA from scat and hair can also be analyzed to determine the sex of the individual, genetic diversity in the population, or even the prey species that it has eaten, um, kind of based on those DNA remains still being in the scat of the predator. The drawbacks to non-invasive genetic sampling are that the DNA on scatter hair breaks down and degrades when it's out in the environment. So sites do need to be checked every week or two, um, but not as frequently as if you were checking a trap with, a, with an animal in it. Another drawback is the cost of having the samples analyzed at the lab. Um, but the benefits of being able to spread your sampling over a large area and, and sample a larger number of individuals 
um, make this a really appealing technique to use. So then trail cameras can be used for um, a variety of, of purposes as well. Um, they can be used for those basic information similar to what you'd get from tra traditional methods, uh, like where a species is occurring. But you have an improvement over a track plate um, because you get a lot of additional information, like what time the animal visited based on the timestamp on the photo, how many individuals visited, because you can see multiple different individuals and tell them apart in a photo. And then for some species, you can even start to identify individuals by their unique markings. Um, so like spots and, and barring on the underside of a bobcat uh, is different for each individual. And if you can see it in the picture, you can make that identification. Or you can identify individuals based on ear tags or a, a radio collar that they might have. So one application that we're doing with Game and Fish presently, and we have been since about 2012 um, in conjunction with NMSU at that point, but now we're running this on our own, um, is using bear hair snares to estimate population size within a bear management zone. A hair snare is really just a corral made up of barbed wire wrapped around three or more trees with bait in the center. We use two strands of wire, uh, one low enough that the bears can't belly crawl under without hitting the wire, um, but high enough that it's not likely to catch cubs. And then a higher strand that the bears can't step over without hitting the wire. Uh, the barbs on the barbed wire pull the hair from the bear as it passes the wire um, to go get that bait in the center. We then visit the snares weekly, um, every seven to 10 days usually, and we're running those hair snares between June and August, which is right around the breeding time and when bears are moving the most. Um, the snare sites are arranged in grids of nine to 12. Um, nine to 12 uh, sites set close enough so that three or four sites could probably capture one bear within its home range. Um, that way we capture them in multiple places, which is an important thing once we start looking at these statistical models we use. <coughs> uh, there are then, then we have multiple grids across the bear management zone um, so that we sample a representative amount of the zone. So advances in these statistical models that we use make it so we don't have to evenly and entirely cover an area with these traps or snares to get a population estimate. And instead we can kind of run them in these clusters that you see on this map, um, which saves time and effort. We don't have to have so many sites out. Um, so these advances that they've made in statistical modeling um, have made it so we can reduce our effort. And then we reduce it even further by using the hair snares that um, capture multiple individuals and only need to be visited once a week. So it's a really advantageous technique um, and it's worked pretty well for us. So when we're looking at setting these hair snares, kind of just to get into the mind uh, of, you know, being out in the field and basically getting into the mind of a bear, um, it's somewhat important for bears that you want to be in an area where they'll be traveling nearby. Um, you're going to want to be in habitat that they use. But because we use bait and uh, spray a scent lure all over the site, we rely a lot on a bear's excellent sense of smell and kind of their insatiable appetite to get them to come into these sites. Uh, site visit consists of checking to see if the bait pile is touched, which can be a good giveaway that a bear was there, although other animals will also eat the bait that we put out. And then you visually scan each barb on the, on the strand of barbed wire to see if any hair was left behind. We put that hair in a uh, paper envelope, um, keep it dry, keep it out of sunlight and bring it back to, uh, bring it back to the headquarters and store it in a dry area. Um, and we then send them off at the end of the field season uh, to be analyzed at a genetics lab, get those individual identifications. And then it all goes into that statistical model that estimates the population size for bears in the area. And as you can see in that photo in the center, the bears do go between the strands, under the strands, over the strands, and that's how we get the hair. Um, and you can see in this video here um, that the bait works well, uh, and we get multiple bears in. Um, we do get sows with cubs and, and the bait does seem to be effective for attracting all bears. Um, this sow and cub actually came in at least three times to this site. And something that has interested us uh, and that we're trying out in combination with the hair snare technique is to also deploy a trail camera at the site 
um, in New Mexico, as you can see on, um, on, we only have black bears. Um, grizzly bears were extirpated in the early 1900s. However, our black bears, as you can see with that sow, um, can be a variety of colors from the standard black to chocolate, to cinnamon, to blonde. And often they have a mix of, of some of these col colors. So we're interested in also the possibility of identifying how many individuals you see at a site, given their different coloration to tell them apart um, and using a trail camera to see whether you can start to get at the number of bears in an area. So this would be useful. Um, so after we run these hair snare studies, which are still a pretty big undertaking, um, especially because the, the amount of ground that we cover and they require a team of technicians. Um, so we do those uh, intermittently, not every year. Um, right now, our plan is probably once every five to 10 years, we do this hair snare study. But if in between, we can start to pick individuals apart and get a count of individuals from trail cameras, um, then in those years between doing the hair snare study, we can still keep track of the population and still get somewhat of a count, um, although it probably won't be as reliable as the hair snare studies. So another application of non-invasive monitoring and one where we're, where we're relying heavily on trail cameras is our cougar monitoring using a combination of GPS collars and trail cameras. This approach uses both traditional methods, uh, which is to capture the animal, put a collar on them, a GPS tracking collar. And then it uses more modern non-invasive techniques by using those trail cameras. So this combination has produced very precise estimates for cougar population size, um, which is notoriously hard to do given how elusive cougars are and then also how large of an area they cover. The, pro the approach consists of capturing cougars by either trapping or using hounds and fitting them with GPS tracking collars. Then we deploy trail cameras in uh, across a cougar management zone in a similar way to kind of how we deploy the bear hair snares with clusters of sites distributed across the zone. Um, so we have that initial capture of the cougar in the trap or with hounds and, and put the collar on it. And then those trail cameras give us a recapture of either collared cougars who um, who are passing by and, and using the area, or we get captures of cougars that we haven't collared that are unmarked. Um, those captures on camera then kind of combine with the movement data with the cougars um, who, who have GPS collars. All, all that data fits into a, an advanced statistical model that estimates and kind of arranges those seen collared cougars, the seen uncollared cougars, and then an estimated number of unseen cougars. And that's, what, uh, that's how it comes up with an estimate of how many cougars there are in an area from the arrangement of those um, three different classes of cougars. And there's a lot of other data too that we can collect from these trail camera photos as well. Uh, you see here a video of a female with kittens, which if we get enough different females with kittens uh, across the area, we can start to get an estimate of average litter size or kind of reproductive uh, capacity of this population. Or where we see males and females together, like you saw um, a colored uh, male and a colored or uncolored female in the previous slide in a photo, uh, we can start to look at patterns and timing of breeding um, or in some parts of the state where we have deer and elk herds with long migration patterns, uh, trail cameras along with GPS collars on, on cougars can start to look at how the lions respond to those movements of the prey populations uh, and whether they're moving with them as well. Uh, but it's not just cougars and bears that we're getting on camera. Um, it's, during these studies, we get a lot of other species uh, that show up in the photos. And so there are, there are other opportunities to monitor spe these species using cameras, um, whether it's from those incidental photos that we get during a cougar study, or if we start to design studies for these species as well. So recently we deployed cameras to try and get a better idea of the range of martens, uh, Pacific martens in New Mexico, which occur in our, our high elevation mountains in the northern part of the state, um, specifically and, and most commonly um, in the high elevation areas of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which is where we were running these cameras. We've also set cameras on scent posts where we're collecting scat uh, for non-invasive genetic sampling again, um, but this time for swift fox out in the northeast part of the state. And then we're also looking at the possibility of using trail cameras to estimate bobcat population size 
uh, using those unique markings on the underside of the belly, like you can see the armbands on this bobcat here. So there are even more opportunities to exist uh, a variety of other questions other than just population size. Uh, we can start to look at you know, disease prevalence for things like mange, um, or you can start to look at reproductive success for, for, for maybe deer or elk as we get photos of fawns with does and calves and cows. Um, we also get some pretty interesting predator-prey interactions that, that show up as well. Uh, the amount of data that we're generating from uh, DNA collected off of scat and hair and from having trail cameras deployed throughout the state, uh, it presents us with a unique and uh, kind of exciting opportunity to inform our management decisions. These methods have opened a lot of doors with how easy they are to use, uh, the relatively low effort that they need, and then how unintrusive they are as they let us get a, a peek into these animals' lives without disturbing them. So all of this aids us in our mission to gather the best data that we can so we get good science to, to drive our wildlife management decisions. So with that and uh, kind of a view of the, the different species that we get, and big and small, game and non-game, um, I'll leave you guys with uh, kind of that info. And if you, if you need anything or have any questions about it, uh, we'll always be running these kinds of studies in, in, in my program. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. I want to thank you, Nick, for your time today. Um, a lot of great information there. I, I enjoyed your, your presentation. I learned a bunch. Um, you guys are doing fantastic work and, and keep it up. And, uh, before I let you go today, um, I'm not going to let you get away just yet, but, um, I've got one question for you, Nick. If, if, uh, you know, we've got someone that was interested in getting into a career in wildlife and fisheries, um, you know, are, are there any life skills that you have found that you use or have used, you know, in any of your careers since you started, once you got out of college that you weren't necessarily taught, you know, you didn't learn it in mid school or high school or college, you know, you, you weren't taught it in school, but something that someone could work at. Sure. I think, uh, you know, for, for the folks who would be interested in becoming wildlife biologists, I think a lot of people get hung up on um, some of the technical skills and trying to have this really uh, in-depth knowledge that you need. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess this one ties a bit more to school, which is don't give up on math. If you want to be a wildlife biologist, you need to be able to do math and you need to be at least be, uh, you know, um, be able to, to understand the basics of, of, of some complex stuff too. And so that's a deterrent for a lot of people, but you don't have to be a math whiz or anything like that. Um, I certainly can't come up with new math or do any kind of crazy things, but having a general understanding and being able to just take it in and then use it is, is a key thing. Um, but also when folks get into uh, wildlife biology and they start thinking about becoming a biologist, um, they really get fixated on one species. Um, and they really think uh, as they're coming up through, through undergraduate and, and getting their bachelor's degree um, or getting into even college, they think they want to work with one species and, and that's what they're going to do. And I'd say keep an open mind and, uh, and instead maybe look to find work um, and work on whatever projects you can because you'll gain a lot of information from them. Um, and just if you're doing work well, um, if, if, if you're, you know, reliable, then that really stands out because no matter how much you know about a species, really what's going to um, help propel you through this career is the the recommendations that you get uh, and, and kind of um, people touting and, and praising you for, for the work that you do. Um, those references really carry a lot of weight and especially um, us wildlife biologists, especially state wildlife biologists, you figure for, for bear and cougar or something like that, there's only one of us in each state or for fur bears, there's only one of us in each state. So in the country, there's, there's 50 biologists that work on that one species and we all know each other. So if you work, uh, work hard and, and are diligent, um, then it carries a long way and, and, and it's memorable for the people that you're working for so that you get these good references. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is, is something um, that I learned working construction from a young age and always being on a job site with my dad was um, at the end of the day, clean up your work site. And uh, whether that means you're picking up your tools and putting them away or 
you're making sure that your data is all in, in order and you've got everything labeled um, or whether it's at the end of the project and you're wrapping up all those loose ends and, and um, making sure that you've got everything in place and you're talking with your supervisor about you know, what went missing, what didn't, what could have gone better. R wrap it up at the end of the day uh, and clean up your work site um, and, and not just kind of in the, the straightforward sense, but make sure you're wrapping things up at the end. Um, and staying on top of things and not being sloppy with things. And I think that that's always kind of, uh, you know, helped me stand out at the end of a project and at the end of the day when working with other people. So I'd recommend, recommend that as well. Well, cool. I, I appreciate your insight. And that was um, great advice right there, Nick. And I know you all are extremely busy and, and just, you know, can't thank you enough for joining us today. And I know everybody that watches this is going to enjoy it immensely. And with that, we'll go ahead and end today's recording and hope everybody has a beautiful day.